Everyone loves a good landmark. The Roman Colosseum, the ancient city of Machu Picchu, the Giza pyramids. But have you ever wondered how it once looked? Way back in the days when they were built? Or even in the time they were covered in ivy and forgotten by humanity? Buckle up, cause we're heading on a time travel adventure to the world's greatest archeological sites. Our voyage begins in South America, deep inside the Peruvian mountains. Behold, the city of Machu Picchu. Machu Picchu is a monument to the ingenuity and power of the Inca civilization. During its prime, the Inca civilization stretched 2,500 miles along South America's coastline from modern-day Ecuador all the way down to Chile. And Machu Picchu was located at the heart and center of it. The historic site was constructed at around 7,000 feet above sea level, more or less around 1450 BCE. The gated city consisted of around 150 buildings made of stone. The Incas managed to build temples, houses, and even a complex aqueduct system to irrigate the entire town. And yes, they did all that without the help of wheels or any instrument made of iron. The housing model is somewhat similar to stone houses we see nowadays, with the difference that the Incas didn't use any cement to stick together the blocks of stone. Yet, they fit seamlessly on top of each other. Not only that, the Incas must have developed a rudimentary yet effective anti-earthquake technology, since in the event of a quake, the rocks would shake without falling out of place. If Machu Picchu had been built today, it would have cost over $70 million to finish the entire thing. The purpose of the site is still a mystery to many historians. Theories suggest that it could have been built as a ceremonial site, a safety base for the Inca people, or even a retreat for royalty. What we know for a fact is that in the 16th century, 100 years after Machu Picchu was built, its population abandoned it, with tree roots taking over the majority of the site and keeping it hidden from humankind for over four centuries. It wasn't until the 20th century that the world was reintroduced to Machu Picchu when a Peruvian farmer led Yale University professor Hiram Bingham III to visit the site. Since then, Bingham and many other explorers dedicated their lives and research to studying the archaeological wonder of Machu Picchu. Now, for the next stop on our time-traveling vehicle, the city of Pompeii in Italy. Pompeii has crowded our collective imagination for many years. The eruption of the Mount Vesuvius volcano in 79 AD and the destruction of an entire city is hopefully not something that will happen again. But I bet you're wondering, what did Pompeii look like on its last day? It took 18 hours for Pompeii's streets, markets, houses, and forums to be buried under millions of tons of volcanic ash. Thanks to some clever scientists, we discovered that the lava and ashes that covered Pompeii on its very last day actually helped to freeze the city in time. Different from ice, the cloud of ashes did not preserve the city intact. But as the items disintegrated over 2,000 years, they left voids under the earth. Archaeologists found that if they filled these voids with plaster, the shape of the buried city would soon reveal itself. And that's exactly what happened. Of course, it was nothing like the bustling city of 12,000 people that had existed for many years before the fateful eruption. Pompeii was a vibrant and rich municipality. The site's ruins revealed that many areas of Pompeii boasted impressive houses, some with balconies, which was a sign of great wealth at the time. And believe it or not, even some artwork survived the eruption. Archaeologists found well-preserved frescoes and murals of mythological creatures, all indicating that members of the high society lived there. Ruins show the city even had thermal baths and showers made with luxurious materials. Oh, and apparently, the people of Pompeii had amazing teeth. Yes, archaeologists could see even that tiny level of detail from the plaster molds they recovered from underground. Still in the Italian territory, we find one of the world's biggest tourist attractions, the Roman Colosseum. It was built as an amphitheater during the reign of Emperor Vespasian, around 70 AD. It wasn't until 80 AD that Vespasian's son, Emperor Titus, inaugurated the Colosseum. The monument was something to behold, with 157-foot-tall walls, over 80 entrances, and the capacity to host 87,000 people. All social classes and groups were welcome at the Colosseum, 
and this partly explains why it flourished for so many centuries. During the decline of the Roman Empire, around the 6th century AD, the Colosseum started being neglected and abandoned. The monument was looted, and some of its columns and stones were used to build infrastructure elsewhere. Only one-third of the original Colosseum still remains, and if it's big now, imagine what it once was. Greece was home to one of the world's largest empires. At the height of this empire, literally and historically speaking, more or less 2400 years ago, the Greeks built a citadel known as the Acropolis. The Acropolis, which is composed of historical buildings, is considered to be one of the biggest landmarks of Western civilization to date. Tourists that visit the capital city of Athens today may be faced with yellowish and broken pillars of the Parthenon standing way up high in one of the city's hills. But way back when it was built, between 447 and 432 BCE, the imposing and majestic Parthenon was purely white as the entire monument was built with gleaming white marble. The statues inside were made of gold. The Parthenon is a 23,000 square foot temple held up by 69 marble columns. The largest blocks of marble are massive, weighing around 10 tons each. And the most surprising fact is that the marble didn't come from Athens, but from a nearby site that stood 10 miles from the Acropolis known as Mount Pentelicon. Historians intrigued by where the primary material for building the Acropolis came from found tiny and big blocks of marble all scattered around the floor of Mount Pentelicon. There was also a paved road that the Greeks had built to carry the rocks around. But perhaps the most impacting monument of all times is located at the heart of the Middle East, outside the Egyptian city of Cairo. The pyramids are considered one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. The Giza Pyramid Complex was built as a tomb for the pharaoh Khufu around 4,500 years ago. Between 20 to 30,000 people took part in the construction process. It's composed of three pyramids. The massive monument is made out of approximately 8,000 tons of granite and over 550,000 tons of mortar, which gives it the appearance it has today. Would you believe me if I told you that the pyramids didn't always look like this? Far from it. They were shiny white with a golden triangular tip at the top. This is because the Egyptians used over 6 million tons of limestone to cover the entire rocky, step-like structure. All so that they could gleam white under the unforgiving sunlight of Egyptian skies. The Pyramid of Khufu remained the tallest structure on Earth made by humans for over 3,800 years. It was the only eight-sided pyramid in Egypt and was believed to align with Orion's belt. It's considered to be the most aligned construction facing north. In 1979, it was inscribed on the UNESCO World Heritage List. Let's head on down to the Indian city of Agra to quickly visit the Taj Mahal. You may know it as the Taj, but it can also be called by its more endearing name, a teardrop in the cheek of time. The Taj took over 22 years to build and was commissioned in 1632 by Mughal Emperor Shah Jahan as a declaration of love for his third and favorite wife, Mumtaz Mahal. It was made with ivory white marble and amazingly, due to tight conservation, it still remains very similar to what it was when it was built. I think all this talk of landmarks got me thirsty for some traveling. What about you? So how come the world is still talking about a statue that only existed for a mere 54 years over 2,000 years ago? What made this impressive ancient construction so remarkable that we're still discussing it? I'm talking about the Colossus of Rhodes, of course. It's considered to be one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, along with the Great Pyramid of Giza or the Gardens of Babylon. There are a lot of mysteries surrounding this ancient statue, but let's look at some of the facts first, shall we? What we do know is that the local Rhodians decided to start a massive project once a Macedonian siege over their island was over. In other words, it was their way of honoring the higher powers for their victory. Using a lot of material left behind by the Macedonians, they started the construction of the Colossus, which is estimated to have taken about 12 years. Most contemporary descriptions of the sculpture agree that it stood about 105 feet tall. Now, just to compare, that's about the size of the Statue of Liberty today, which is 151 feet tall. 
It may not seem like a lot. I mean, Lady Liberty is currently ranked as the 52nd tallest statue in the world. The champion here would be the Statue of Unity in India, standing proud at an astonishing 597 feet. But for ancient times, that was quite an accomplishment. But is the similar height the only connection between the Colossus of Rhodes and the Statue of Liberty? Not really. We do know that they both also refer to Lady Liberty as the modern Colossus, since both statues were constructed as a symbol of liberation. There's even a plaque placed inside the pedestal of the New York statue, inscribed with the first verse of the sonnet, The New Colossus, not like the brazen giant of Greek fame. To build this massive Colossus statue, they sure needed a lot of bronze. Some ancient records even recount that the construction required 27 to 29,000 pounds of bronze. Even for modern times, this is a lot. But back then, they even called it an operation that involved the bronze industry of the entire world. The man tasked with bringing the statue to life was Shars of Lindos, a local Greek sculptor. The whole construction took place from 294 to 282 BCE. But unfortunately, Charles never got to see the end result. We don't know for sure why that happened, but some records claim constructing the Colossus of Rhodes may have led him to complete bankruptcy, since he failed to accurately estimate the cost for the massive statue. Anyway, we still don't know for sure how it was possible to build a statue this big back in those days. They had none of the equipment we have today, like excavators or elevators. Some old records said that they had to invent a completely new, custom method to build it. It all happened on the location, put together piece by piece. They supposedly split the statue into many different sections, and the first one to be constructed was the feet. Once each section was done, huge mounds of earth were placed around it, so they could continue working on the next section above. However, these records were made more than 100 years after the Colossus was finished, so there's little we can say about the accuracy of this information. In all those 12 years, the local Greeks worked around the clock to build the Colossus of Rhodes. They started with a white marble base that they placed at the statue's feet. They then continued with some sort of an iron skeleton, to which they attached the bronze plates. Why did they choose bronze, though? Well, that was more for practical reasons, since bronze is stronger than iron and it can also sustain extreme weather conditions. More so, if you think about it, the statue was located pretty close to the sea, so the air surrounding it would have been pretty salty. That's why they needed to make it out of quite sturdy material. And what about the location? Well, that's something that has been up for debate for a long time. Researchers initially believed that the statue stood with each leg on either side of the Mandrake Harbor, one of many in the city of Rhodes, basically straddling its entrance. As imposing as that may sound, it was likely not the case. First of all, that would have meant the harbor would have to have been closed for the whole duration of the construction, which doesn't seem to match all the other records. More so, after the statue had fallen, it would have probably blocked the entirety of the harbor, which again doesn't seem to be mentioned anywhere. Most recent depictions say that it most likely stood either on the eastern side of the Mandrake Harbor or maybe even further inland. So, what happened to this impressive structure? Is there really nothing left of it to this day? And why did it survive for only 54 years since it took so long to build and it was so important for locals? Well, as admired and valued as it was to the Greeks, an earthquake took the Colossus of Rhodes away from them. The story goes that because of the movement of the earth beneath it, the statue snapped at its knees and was completely laid on the ground. Nonetheless, the statue still continued to be admired for centuries. The Rhodians refused to rebuild it as they considered it a sign and did not dare intervene with destiny. By the middle of the 7th century, they had taken away what was left of the statue completely. Legend says it took about 900 camels to carry all the bronze away from the location. And what about the looks of the statue? This is also one aspect that is still shrouded in mystery. Even though it was a symbol of the locals' pride in maintaining their independence, 
they did not use the depiction of the statue for any of the coins they made, even though that was kind of customary. Other art historians do think, however, that the Colossus was similar to other depictions of the same mythological creature, a male figure that had rays of light rising from its head. The position of its hands is also still up for debate. Some say it might have even been holding a torch. We don't know if his hands were pointed straight down or whether the right arm was raised, like in similar representations in Greek mythology. The original might not be here for us to admire anymore, but there are some plans out there to rebuild it. A group of European architects intends to build a 21st century version of the ancient statue. This new construction is planned to stretch 500 feet tall. It should serve as a cultural center combined with a lighthouse. To make sure it won't have the same destiny as its ancient ancestor, these designers intend to use a lot of technology available today. Firstly, they plan to cover the whole exterior of the modern Colossus with solar panels so that the enormous building has enough electricity. They also intend to use modern resources to make sure earthquakes and wind forces won't affect the massive structure yet again. To do that, they plan to build the statue as a tripod structure, made from its two legs and a third pillar of support, constructed from the sash draped over the statue's arm and touching the ground. They also plan to place heavy steel support around the base for counterbalance. They even thought of a suspension system that would permit the statue to rock back and forth, making it a bit more flexible and able to resist all the various weather conditions. The manufacturer's suggested retail price on this project is quite high, though, estimated at around 283 million bucks. Supporters of the modern Colossus are optimistic as they are certain they can raise that impressive amount of cash through crowdfunding and private investments. This summer, you finally decide to go on that once-in-a-lifetime round-the-world trip. The first stop of this exciting adventure is in Europe. You start your journey in Italy, the country of pasta and pizza and delicious gelato. Ah, there it is, the world-renowned Leaning Tower of Pisa. You buy your ticket and get inside the crooked monument. You're about to climb 251 slippery stairs, so watch your step and don't forget to breathe. The white marble stones are astounding, and from time to time, you peep outside to enjoy the view of the city. Congratulations, you've made it! You've reached the top of the bell tower and can take all the selfies you want. The Leaning Tower of Pisa is one of Italy's most iconic landmarks. During your hike up the stairs, a guide tells you it's actually a medieval monument. It was built between the 12th and 14th centuries, taking over 200 years to finish. And, in case you're wondering if it's always been tilted, I can say without a doubt, yes it has. Once they finished the third floor, the bell tower started sinking. The thing is, the very name Pisa comes from the Greek word that means marshy land. The ground there is extremely soft, made of clay, mud, and sand. And architects have been trying to save the day ever since they built the tower. At the top of the 185-foot-tall monument, you take your time admiring the city. How many terracotta rooftops can you count? If you walk toward the south side of the monument, you may feel closer to the ground. This is because the Leaning Tower of Pisa tilts toward the south. At one point, it leaned almost 5.5 degrees and still didn't fall. Today, when you visit the monument, the guide might tell you the tower is leaning less. A few years ago, the world's best architects and engineers did some construction works next to the monument to keep it from falling over. They dug several tunnels and took out over 38 cubic meters of soil from under the north side of the tower. So now the tower is tilting at an angle of only 4 degrees. So if you want to take one of those classic photos where you're holding up the tower, you better hurry. Who knows how long the tower will still be leaning. Now it's time for you to make your way to Rome. This city is basically an open-air museum, and you have to check it out for yourself. It's scalding hot, but you're lucky. Today, you're visiting the Baths of Caracalla. Are you ready for an authentic ancient Roman experience? You enter through what once was a locker room. You'll have to use your imagination. Today, you'll only see 130-foot-tall brick walls here. 
Romans of every class would spend an hour or two in the baths every day. They would come after a long day at work or before dinner. Imperial bath complexes, such as this one, were usually free, but you had to pay an admission fee. Leaving the locker room, visitors would stop in a heated room where they would receive oil and scrub massage. Then, some people would move on to one of two exercise yards. Can you see how ample they were? Here, there were elaborate marble porticos, and you can still see a few fragments of the mosaic-colored floor. If you were in the mood for something more intellectual, you could stop to listen to a philosopher or visit one of the libraries. Now we've arrived at the most impressive room, a caldarium. It was a circular hot steamed room measuring 115 feet in diameter. It had not one or two, but seven heated pools inside. Above your head, you'd have seen a magnificent dome supported by large granite columns. The entire structure was richly decorated with multicolored glass mosaics and the finest white marble. The complex also housed an indoor Olympic-sized pool with waist-deep water. Today, you can only admire a few reddish walls made of brick and concrete. Emperor Caracalla, like many other Roman emperors, built a mega-complex, and it sure made people happy. After a long international flight, you arrive in Egypt. Get ready for some camel rides and juicy dried fruits. Does anyone here love dates? You leave your hotel at dawn and make your way to the outskirts of Cairo. You drive past the Nile River toward the West Bank. Don't forget to take some pictures. In the distance, you spot a large monument. It's the Great Sphinx of Giza. Can you believe people created this monument over 4,500 years ago? Once you get closer, you see the Great Pyramids just north of the Sphinx. You learn that, unlike the pyramids, the Sphinx was carved directly from the bedrock of the Giza Plateau. Until today, it's one of the largest statues in the world, measuring 66 feet in height and 240 feet in length from paws to tail. The face of the Sphinx looks a tad beaten today. But according to archaeologists, it wasn't always like that. A Photoshop reconstruction of the Sphinx gives it a very different look. As you can see, at one point, the Sphinx's nose was chopped off together with parts of the chin. Scientists believe that the statue is a representation of the great pharaoh Khafre. This is why its face resembles a human so much. Just below the eyes, a dark carved line was added to represent the charcoal eyeliner ancient Egyptians used to wear. Fun fact, this wasn't only a beauty habit. It protected their eyes from ultraviolet rays. In a desert region that gets so much sunlight, this might come in handy. Until today, researchers debate whether or not the Sphinx had a beard. Many believe that if it was meant to depict a pharaoh, it most likely had a braided beard that got destroyed by erosion or humans. Even today, you can still see the remains of a regal headdress on the head of the Sphinx. These head ornaments were associated with power and royalty. Now imagine that the stripes are blue and gold. This is probably what it looked like when the monument was first constructed. There's no evidence of how long it took to build the Sphinx, but it was likely very long, as the carved details are pretty impressive. If you're lucky, your guide might take you to one of the secret chambers inside the statue. If they're real and not just a myth, I mean. Ah, the crystalline waters of Greece. Whether you arrive by boat or plane, you're in for a real treat. This is the focal point of archaeological sites. You arrive at Mandraki Marina in port, but wait a minute, you don't see any monuments around. The Colossus of Rhodes is nowhere to be found at first glance. That's because it was destroyed long, long ago. Before tumbling down during a mighty earthquake, the great statue was considered one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. If you saw the Colossus in a picture, you would probably mistake it for Lady Liberty. Well, that's actually not a coincidence. Apparently, there's a connection between the Statue of Rhodes and the Statue of Liberty. They were both built as symbols of freedom, and Lady Liberty is often referred to as the modern Colossus. The Colossus stood at 100 feet tall, but today, all you see is a concrete jetty with a huge gap in the middle. Now, imagine a bronze statue straddling both ends of the bridge. The Colossus was built back in the 3rd century BCE. 
and 900 camels took part in the construction. The statue existed for approximately 54 years before it was ruined by a powerful earthquake. It hit the city so hard that all that was left of the statue was one very large foot. Even so, people kept visiting the monument. The Statue of Liberty is 305 feet tall and stands on Liberty Island in New York. It's one of the most famous tourist attractions that the Big Apple has to offer. It was given to America as a gift from France in 1886. The statue was designed by a French sculptor called Frédéric Auguste Bartholdi. The face of the statue is thought to be based on Bartholdi's mother, Charlotte. The statue's full name is the Statue of Liberty Enlightening the World, which is a bit of a tongue twister. We'll stick with the shortened version for the rest of this video. The total cost to build the statue was over $500,000. In today's economy, that would be worth about $10 million. It took five years to raise the necessary amount of money to build the statue. The project was completed in France in 1885. The statue was then disassembled into 350 pieces so that it could be transported to America. A French ship called Isère transported the statue from Paris to New York. However, a disaster nearly prevented the statue from arriving. The ship almost sank in a bad storm during the voyage. It took four months to reassemble the 350 pieces when they arrived in New York. The monument was officially unveiled in October 1886. The statue is made from 300 overlapping copper plates. These copper plates weigh a total of 31 tons. A further 125 tons of iron were used to build the statue's foundation. The statue itself weighs 225 tons. Its crown has 25 windows. They're thought to represent the natural minerals of the earth. The Statue of Liberty was the tallest iron structure ever built when it was unveiled in 1886. But today, it doesn't even crack the top five when it comes to the tallest existing statues. Let's take a look at several monuments from around the world, which, in some cases, tower over the famous New York Monument. But before we get down to the giants in the world of statues, you should know something. Not all of the most famous statues are physically imposing spectacles. Some of the most renowned monuments are actually quite tiny. This includes the Iron Boy, located in one of the backyards in Stockholm, Sweden. The sculpture depicts a small boy wrapping his arms around his knees. It was created by a Swedish artist called Lis Eriksson in 1967. The statue is only six inches tall. The tiny monument's full name translates to Little Boy Who Looks at the Moon, but people shortened it for their own convenience. The Iron Boy receives all kinds of strange gifts throughout the year. Sometimes he can be seen wearing a cap or a scarf. Guests also leave coins, fruits, and sushi on the stone bench where he sits. There's another famous world monument that's literally as tiny as a mouse. Actually, two mice. The monument is called the Philpot Lane Mice and can be found in London. It depicts two mice fighting over a piece of cheese. The statue was constructed in 1862. The story claims that once, two construction workers had an argument. One was accused of having stolen the other's lunch. This tiny monument is said to be left as a tribute to the event. Starting off the top five of the tallest monuments in the world is the Statue of Belief. It's found in Nathwarda, India. It stands at an impressive 348 feet tall. The statue depicts Shiva, an important symbol of Hinduism. About 2,200 tons of steel were used in the construction of the massive statue. A 300 square foot garden surrounds the statue. More than 750 workers took part in the construction of the monument. Its size allows it to be seen from Kankroli flyover which is roughly 13 miles away. The construction works began in 2012, but the statue was completed just recently. It's probably no surprise that it serves as a major tourist attraction in Nathwara today. The Yushiku Buddha statue is located in Tsukuba in Japan. It's the fourth tallest statue in the world, with a height of 393 feet. The monument weighs an incredible 4,000 tons, 
and was built in 1993 to commemorate the birth of Shinran, a famous Japanese monk. The left hand of the monument is 60 feet long. Tourists can ride an elevator to the viewing gallery, located at almost 280 feet. From here, visitors are treated to incredible views. On a clear day, you can see as far as Tokyo Skytree, which is roughly 42 miles away from the monument. The lovely gardens surrounding the statue are full of flowers in season. Visitors can pick some and take them home. You can see cosmos in September and October, poppies in May, and peonies and hydrangeas in May and June. The third tallest monument on our planet is the Lekun Setkyar. It's found in a village called Katakan Taum in Myanmar. The statue is 423 feet tall. The construction of the monument began in 1996, and it took 12 years to finish. The monument was presented to the public in February 2008. The construction took so much time because it was funded by the public. The monument is a depiction of Buddha Shakyamuni, who many believe to be the founder of Buddhism. The sculpture is painted yellow, which is considered to be the color of wisdom in Buddhism. Each element of the monument is extremely precise and detailed. Many tourists have no idea that inside the monument, there's a special elevator that provides access to 27 different floors. Visitors can enter the statue and look at different paintings on the walls of the lower floors. The inside of the monument also houses a temple. The area outside the statue is a popular landmark for tourists, too. Here you can find the surrounding garden of Bodhi trees, with more than 9,000 plants. Not only are there plenty of plants next to the monument, but there are also thousands of miniature sitting Buddha statues. Keeping with the theme of monuments depicting Buddhas, the runner-up in the competition for the world's largest monument is the Spring Temple Buddha. You'll find it in Henan, China. It's over 500 feet tall. The monument is made up of over 200 pounds of gold, 3,300 tons of copper alloy, and 1,500 tons of steel. It also covers an area of over 11,000 square feet. The diamond seat beneath the statue consists of 6,666 miniature Buddhas. It took 11 years to construct. Construction works began in 1997, and the statue was unveiled in 2008. The entire Spring Temple project cost roughly $50 million, with $18 million spent directly on the materials and construction of the monument. You've waited this long. It's now time to find out the identity of the world's tallest statue. The Statue of Unity is in the state of Gujarat in India. Its height? Just under a record-breaking 600 feet. Worth the wait, right? The statue is a tribute to the Iron Man of India, Sardar Vallabhai Patel. He served as the first Deputy Prime Minister of India from 1947 until 1950. He's credited with merging over 560 princely states into what we now know as the Union of India. Remarkably, when compared to the other statues we've looked at, the Iron Man only took three and a half years to build. It was constructed by a team of 300 engineers and 3,400 workers. The monument is made up of roughly 70,000 tons of cement and nearly 25,000 tons of steel. 12,000 bronze panels cover the structure. The base of the monument is constructed with over 129 tons of scrap iron, donated by nearly 100 million farmers from across India. All in all, the statue weighs a total of 1,700 tons. The Statue of Unity has a viewing gallery that can accommodate 200 visitors at a time. It also hosts a museum with 2,000 photographs, 40,000 documents and video presentations, and a research center. The whole thing is nearly twice the size of the Statue of Liberty. Wow! So, I took a little vacation and traveled to the other side of the country, to New York. Ah, the Big Apple. The city where more than 8 million people live. The home of Broadway, the Empire State Building, Central Park, and the Statue of Liberty. Now, Lady Liberty came to the United States from France back in 1885 in over 300 copper pieces. She came with instructions, some assembly required, batteries not included. 
She was a gift from the French people to the Americans. But the receiving party had to prepare the pedestal for her themselves. Hmm. Instead of New York, the statue could have ended up in Baltimore, Philadelphia, Boston, or even San Francisco. All of these cities were willing to pay for the construction if they got the statue. But New Yorkers wanted it too. They started the fundraising campaign and managed to get all the money needed. So the statue officially called New York home in 1886, where it still resides. Sorry, Philly, I like your cheesesteaks, though. Anyway, the Statue of Liberty was my first stop, and I was very excited. But I had no idea what was to come next. Day 1. I arrived at New York City, and first thing, I took the ferry to Liberty Island. I could see her already, far away in the middle of the harbor. As the ferry approached the statue, all the people started to make pictures with her. I wasn't an exception. I asked someone to take a selfie of me, turned away from the statue, looked in the camera, and smiled. But the guy looked shocked. I asked him what was wrong, and he couldn't say anything. He just pointed to the Statue of Liberty. Well, to where it used to be. Because the statue was just gone. He said it was there, but the next second, it just disappeared. Other people saw that too and started to ask each other what happened. But no one had any idea. Still, we reached the dock and got out of the ferry. It felt like it was just some trick, but apparently it wasn't. The Statue of Liberty was really gone, and its pedestal was totally empty. Of course, there were some people who climbed up on it, pretending to be the Statue of Liberty themselves and taking photos. Very soon, authorities arrived and didn't let anyone leave the island. They said they wanted to make an investigation and catch the thief, since the thief should still be there on the island. As if it's actually possible to steal the Statue of Liberty. They interrogated every single person on the island. We spent the whole day there, and in the end, they had to let us go. Who had the Statue of Liberty hidden in their pockets? <laughs> what a surprise. Day 2. That was one crazy case. So I decided to stick around in New York for a while to watch how the situation would progress. Of course, in the morning, it's all in the newspapers, magazines, and on TV talk shows. All the Times Square banners are showing the photos of the statue with headings, Have you seen me? The Statue of Liberty is gone. And even dramatic ones like, The theft of the century. The Statue of Liberty is stolen. Well, the whole Big Apple is mourning the loss. There is some crazy number of people colored in blue-green, like the patina on the statue, wearing dresses and the souvenir foam crown of Miss Liberty. By the way, all the local souvenir stores ran out of those, as well as all those little plastic statues of Liberty, too. I'm trying to avoid Instagram or any other social networks. Every celebrity and every single user posts pictures of the statue with a crying emoji and a broken heart. The internet turned into one big memorial. In the evening, the Empire State Building is shining blue-green in honor of the missing statue. Day 5. New York City is even more crowded now. It seems like all of America came to the city to make sure that the statue is actually gone and it's not some internet hoax. Like we need another one of those. Now, the edge of Manhattan from where the ferry used to go to Liberty Island is overcrowded. There are many super loyal fans colored in blue-green, who honestly freak me out a bit, who are staying there all day long, waiting for the statue to somehow come back. No one is allowed to go to Liberty Island. All the best detectives of the world arrive there to investigate this case, trying to figure out what could have happened. Day 10. France officially announced that they'll make a new Statue of Liberty for New York. Well, that's super nice of them. But people keep crying, saying that no new Statue of Liberty can replace the original one, so dearly loved. Do you remember that back in 1885, there were other cities like Boston and Philadelphia that wanted to get the statue? Well now, they're blaming New York for losing a 151 high statue, weighing 450,000 pounds, claiming it never would have happened had the statue been set in Boston or Philly. Which honestly sounds absurd. Also, did you know that there's more Statues of Liberty in the world? 
There's a smaller version of it which was given by the US citizens to France a couple of years after the original one was set in New York. This little monument, just 37 feet high, has been standing near the Grinnell Bridge in Paris. Well, until a couple of days ago. To comfort the Americans, France transported the little copy from Paris to New York, and they put it on the pedestal instead of the one that was gone. Well, given that this one is more than 10 times smaller than the original, it looks a bit… funny. But I guess New Yorkers just can't imagine New York without one, even if it's just a replica. Also, there's a life-size copy of Lady Liberty's torch standing in Paris. Well, that one was also transported to New York and set on Liberty Island as a monument. Meanwhile, the folks in Las Vegas at the New York New York Casino and Hotel are staying awfully quiet for some reason, trying to stay under the radar about that statue ruckus. Hmm. Day 20. The world started a huge fundraising campaign to raise the money for the new Statue of Liberty. And then it ended. It took just 2 hours and 47 minutes to raise all the $100 million that was needed. Almost 2 billion people from nearly every single country in the world donated. The construction is going to start in 2 weeks in Paris, France, just like in the good old times. And then it'll be transported to the US again. Boston is still trying to insist that we shouldn't trust New York with the statue anymore. But I don't think they'll manage to persuade the world because this little replica on the pedestal still looks funny. I'll never get used to it. Also, starting today, tourists are allowed to travel to Liberty Island for the first time since the incident. It seems like all of New York wants to visit the island now, so the authorities had to go with a digital queue. All the tickets for the next two months are already booked, and it happened in less than 10 minutes. Well, given the 8 million New Yorkers and more than 250 million tourists New York City welcomes every year, I think I'll be able to visit the island about, oh, next decade. Day 31. Crazy news. Can't believe it. The Statue of Liberty, and I mean the original one, is back. They say it appeared in the middle of the night. The smaller replica is now standing next to the pedestal, and the original Lady Liberty is in its rightful place. I needed to see it, so I rushed to the harbor, just like everyone else in New York. It actually is bad. No one still knows what happened. The great minds of the world still can't solve the mystery. David Copperfield has an airtight alibi. But if you ask me, I think that the statue just left by itself. Maybe it just needed a vacation. I can picture it chilling on a beach in Central America. Can't blame it. Standing there for more than 100 years without a single day off, always being patient with all the people constantly taking pictures of you. That's not an easy job. I'm glad it took a little vacation. Maybe we won't lose it for another 15 decades. Hey, we were all worried, and she's standing there like nothing happened. Hello, Brightsiders! Do you know what's hidden inside President Lincoln's head or at the Grand Station Terminal in New York? Today, I will reveal secrets about America's best-known landmarks you have never heard of. At the towering granite faces of Mount Rushmore, there's a hidden chamber inside President Lincoln's head, built initially to hold essential documents from US history. The original plan was to create a much larger carving of several vital moments in American history. Unfortunately, it was far too complicated to be completed, and a hall of records was chosen instead. The construction stopped for many years with the room left unfinished. However, the project was revived in late 90s and they completed the chamber. The hidden room tells the U.S.'s story to future generations, a time capsule of American history. Sadly, tourists can't access the secret room as it's too difficult to reach. Anyone running through the Grand Central Terminal to get to their train on time knows that you work up quite a sweat. Some hidden Manhattanites are also working up a sweat somewhere else at the station. Few commuters realize that the Grand Central Terminal has been home to a tennis club for decades. It mainly serves 
local sports fans and corporate groups, so most people don't even know it exists. Vanderbilt Tennis Club is located on the station's upper levels and includes a full gymnasium, one full-sized indoor hard court, and even a junior court. While it might seem strange to join, the tennis and fitness club is quite popular among the locals. Most of the Supreme Court building is what you'd expect. Courtrooms, offices, and other generally dull workspaces. But that's until you get to the fifth floor. The building has a hidden basketball court, nicknamed the highest court in the land. This court is frequented by many of the building's workers. The room was initially designed as a storage space, but some people started turning it into a makeshift court to practice their tennis game. The trend took off and eventually it turned into a basketball court we know today. One of the most fascinating things about Niagara Falls is how naturally falling water is used to generate energy. The falls had slowed to a trickle or even stopped because of freezing and ice on several occasions. But a little known secret of the falls is that they can be turned off. And in 1969, the US Army Corps of Engineers did just that. To generate hydroelectric power, engineers developed ways to control the water's flow and fall to get the most out of it. All this water causes lots of erosion, so a facelift was planned. Unfortunately, the plan ended up being a bit of a failure. Meanwhile, this lady is no failure. She's an icon, a symbol of hope, and one of the most recognizable figures in the world. And she wears size 879 shoes. The Statue of Liberty is one of the most recognizable structures in the USA and in the world. In 1886, the monument wasn't just symbolic. For 16 years, the statue functioned as a fully operational lighthouse. Tourists at the US landmark can head to her crown for a stunning city view. But there used to be a room in the torch that could be accessed. Unfortunately, the ladder to the torch room was damaged by a shockwave from a nearby explosion, making the room inaccessible from 1916 until today. And it hasn't welcomed any visitors since. When the Brooklyn Bridge was first under construction, the engineers faced two significant problems. Well, the city didn't have enough money to pay for the whole project, that's a first and local vineries were refusing to relocate out of the path of the construction. The engineer managed to find a great solution to both problems. They helped finance the bridge by building wine cellars and renting them out to local businesses that needed the extra storage. That's a pretty genius approach to financing a bridge, actually. Today, the city of New York has taken ownership of the cellars and stripped the caverns of their original functionality. Now, they are primarily unused and full of maintenance equipment. Disneyland has fast become one of the most famous landmarks in America. Hardcore fans might think they know all of the park's secrets, but some might even surprise regular park. Hidden behind an unmarked door in Disneyland's New Orleans Square, you can find a posh, expensive restaurant called Club 33. If dining here is on your to-do list for your next vacation, you better start saving your money right now. The price to enter is a little expensive, costing around $25,000 to join, plus an annual fee of $12,000. If you feel wrong about never being a part of Club 33, maybe this will cheer you up. The waiting list can be up to 14 years long, and even Walt Disney himself never got to see it. The Golden Gate Bridge was once the world's longest suspension bridge. This eye-catching 1.7 mile long feat of engineering was completed in 1937. While many people know that the bridge is constantly being repainted, did you know that the paint color, which looks red, 
is called International Orange. Interestingly, the color was just a primer, but it turned out to be quite visible through the thick fog. The bridge's original color plan was suggested to be black with yellow stripes to maximize its visibility for passing ships. That's quite an ugly combination, I think. Most people who visit the Lincoln Memorial are in awe of the size and view of the reflecting pool. Some even spend all of their energy trying to find the famous typo carved into the walls. In the line, with high hope for the future, the sculptor mistakenly spell the future with an E instead of an F. Yet they tried filing it in, but the typo is still visible. Visiting the Gateway Arc to look at the city of St. Louis is like looking back in time. Most visitors don't know that the Arc also provides a glimpse back to its construction. Built to withstand earthquakes and high winds, the Arc can move and bend as much as 18 inches in high winds. The Arc is the tallest national monument in the United States, standing at 630 feet. Few people realize that it's 630 feet wide as well. That's impressive. The most peculiar thing about this spectacular construction isn't just its story, but that it also contains the stories of over 600,000 people from St. Louis, hidden underneath the deluxe Walford Astoria Hotel is the secluded platform called Track 61, part of the Grand Central Terminal. A railway car, believed to be designed for President Franklin D. Roosevelt, was left in the station for decades before being removed. This private train car was able to pull into the underground station where he could come and go unseen by the public. Unfortunately, the car turned out to be just for transporting parts of construction materials, which is not really as cool as transporting a president. The Liberty Bell features one of history's most famous repair jobs. Well, actually, lack of repair jobs. The bell was tested, split, and repaired when first received. And it just got worse from there. After nearly 90 years of use, a narrow crack formed in the Liberty Bell in 1840s. When the city of Philadelphia sought to repair the bell in 1846, metal workers made the crack even worse. Attempts were made to repair the existing rupture in the bell, but it was subsequently fractured beyond repair. After all of this, it had to be taken out of service for good. The bell we see today is just a replica. Not one person alive today has heard the authentic, original sound of the bell. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side. Everyone loves a good landmark. The Roman Colosseum, the ancient city of Machu Picchu, the Giza pyramids. But have you ever wondered how it once looked? Way back in the days when they were built, or even in the time they were covered in ivy and forgotten by humanity. Buckle up, because we're heading on a time travel adventure to the world's greatest archaeological sites. Our voyage begins in South America, deep inside the Peruvian mountains. Behold, the city of Machu Picchu. Machu Picchu is a monument to the ingenuity and power of the Inca civilization. During its prime, the Inca civilization stretched 2,500 miles along South America's coastline from modern-day Ecuador all the way down to Chile. And Machu Picchu was located at the heart and center of it. The historic site was constructed at around 7,000 feet above sea level, more or less around 1450 BCE. The gated city consisted of around 150 buildings made of stone. The Incas managed to build temples, houses, and even a complex aqueduct system to irrigate the entire town. And yes, they did all that without the help of wheels or any instrument made of iron. The housing model is somewhat similar to stone houses we see nowadays, with the difference that the Incas didn't use any cement to stick together the blocks of stone. Yet, they fit seamlessly on top of each other. Not only that, the Incas must have developed a rudimentary, yet effective, anti-earthquake technology, since, in the event of a quake, 
the rocks would shake without falling out of place. If Machu Picchu had been built today, it would have cost over $70 million to finish the entire thing. The purpose of the site is still a mystery to many historians. Theories suggest that it could have been built as a ceremonial site, a safety base for the Inca people, or even a retreat for royalty. What we know for a fact is that in the 16th century, 100 years after Machu Picchu was built, its population abandoned it, with tree roots taking over the majority of the site and keeping it hidden from humankind for over four centuries. It wasn't until the 20th century that the world was reintroduced to Machu Picchu when a Peruvian farmer led Yale University professor Hiram Bingham III to visit the site. Since then, Bingham and many other explorers dedicated their lives and research to studying the archaeological wonder of Machu Picchu. Now, for the next stop on our time-traveling vehicle, the city of Pompeii in Italy. Pompeii has crowded our collective imagination for many years. The eruption of the Mount Vesuvius volcano in 79 AD and the destruction of an entire city is hopefully not something that will happen again. But I bet you're wondering, what did Pompeii look like on its last day? It took 18 hours for Pompeii's streets, markets, houses, and forums to be buried under millions of tons of volcanic ash. Thanks to some clever scientists, we discovered that the lava and ashes that covered Pompeii on its very last day actually helped to freeze the city in time. Different from ice, the cloud of ashes did not preserve the city intact. But as the items disintegrated over 2,000 years, they left voids under the earth. Archaeologists found that if they filled these voids with plaster, the shape of the buried city would soon reveal itself. And that's exactly what happened. Of course, it was nothing like the bustling city of 12,000 people that had existed for many years before the fateful eruption. Pompeii was a vibrant and rich municipality. The site's ruins revealed that many areas of Pompeii boasted impressive houses, some with balconies, which was a sign of great wealth at the time. And believe it or not, even some artwork survived the eruption. Archaeologists found well-preserved frescoes and murals of mythological creatures, all indicating that members of the high society lived there. Ruins show the city even had thermal baths and showers made with luxurious materials. Oh, and apparently, the people of Pompeii had amazing teeth. Yes, archaeologists could see even that tiny level of detail from the plaster molds they recovered from underground. Still in the Italian territory, we find one of the world's biggest tourist attractions, the Roman Colosseum. It was built as an amphitheater during the reign of Emperor Vespasian, around 70 AD. It wasn't until 80 AD that Vespasian's son, Emperor Titus, inaugurated the Colosseum. The monument was something to behold, with 157-foot-tall walls, over 80 entrances, and the capacity to host 87,000 people. All social classes and groups were welcome at the Colosseum, and this partly explains why it flourished for so many centuries. During the decline of the Roman Empire, around the 6th century AD, the Colosseum started being neglected and abandoned. The monument was looted, and some of its columns and stones were used to build infrastructure elsewhere. Only one-third of the original Colosseum still remains. And if it's big now, imagine what it once was. Greece was home to one of the world's largest empires. At the height of this empire, literally and historically speaking, more or less 2,400 years ago, the Greeks built a citadel known as the Acropolis. The Acropolis, which is composed of historical buildings, is considered to be one of the biggest landmarks of Western civilization to date. Tourists that visit the capital city of Athens today may be faced with yellowish and broken pillars of the Parthenon standing way up high in one of the city's hills. But way back when it was built, between 447 and 432 BCE, the imposing and majestic Parthenon was purely white as the entire monument was built with gleaming white marble. The statues inside were made of gold. The Parthenon is a 23,000 square foot temple held up by 69 marble columns. The largest blocks of marble are massive, weighing around 10 tons each. And the most surprising fact is that the marble didn't come from Athens, but from a nearby site that stood 10 miles from the Acropolis known as Mount Pentelikon. Historians intrigued by where the primary material for building the Acropolis came from 
found tiny and big blocks of marble all scattered around the floor of Mount Pentelikon. There was also a paved road that the Greeks had built to carry the rocks around. But perhaps the most impacting monument of all times is located at the heart of the Middle East, outside the Egyptian city of Cairo. The pyramids are considered one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. The Giza Pyramid Complex was built as a tomb for the pharaoh Khufu around 4,500 years ago. Between 20 to 30,000 people took part in the construction process. It's composed of three pyramids. The massive monument is made out of approximately 8,000 tons of granite and over 550,000 tons of mortar, which gives it the appearance it has today. Would you believe me if I told you that the pyramids didn't always look like this? Far from it. They were shiny white with a golden triangular tip at the top. This is because the Egyptians used over 6 million tons of limestone to cover the entire rocky, step-like structure. All so that they could gleam white under the unforgiving sunlight of Egyptian skies. The Pyramid of Khufu remained the tallest structure on Earth made by humans for over 3,800 years. It was the only eight-sided pyramid in Egypt and was believed to align with Orion's belt. It's considered to be the most aligned construction facing north. In 1979, it was inscribed on the UNESCO World Heritage List. Let's head on down to the Indian city of Agra to quickly visit the Taj Mahal. You may know it as the Taj, but it can also be called by its more endearing name, a teardrop in the cheek of time. The Taj took over 22 years to build and was commissioned in 1632 by Mughal Emperor Shah Jahan as a declaration of love for his third and favorite wife, Mumtaz Mahal. It was made with ivory white marble and amazingly, due to tight conservation, it still remains very similar to what it was when it was built. I think all this talk of landmarks got me thirsty for some traveling. What about you? So how come the world is still talking